Commissioner of the Southeastern Conference, Mr. Greg Sankey. Thank you, Kevin. Welcome to Atlanta. It's good to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to be efficient in my remarks. I'm reminded of the great American philosopher Vincent Spicoli, who once observed that you're here and I'm here, so it's really our time to talk about that which is on my mind and try to save you some time as well. We should never take for granted that we're able to gather together after what we've experienced the last two years. We want to make sure this is a valuable time, and so we have staff and volunteers here to support your effort, and please reach out if they may be of assistance. It's good to be in Atlanta. It's a city of history for the Southeastern Conference. It was here in 1933 that the conference conducted its first annual meeting. So it wasn't annual at that point, it became annual. It's also the site of the conference's first ever men's basketball tournament, that also happening in 1933. It's happened here 12 times since, including one interrupted by a tornado. It's been the home of our football championship game since 1994. We moved media days, which is, doesn't happen a lot in, in conferences. We moved media days here in 2018. We planned to be back in 2020 until COVID hit, and it's great to be back here today. We're excited for the start of the season. You're gonna hear that 14 more times from this podium, I expect, right? Uh, but part of the excitement being here is on September 3rd, Oregon and Georgia will play in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. As you look to the end of the season or towards the end of the season, the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl will host one of the college football playoff semifinals on December 31st. Looking back, when we wrapped up in Indianapolis, Georgia's football team won the third consecutive national championship in football by an SEC team, and just because it's fun to remember, LSU in 2020, excuse me, 2019, Alabama in 2020, and Georgia in 2021, or at least those seasons. I thought that was great. That would be my, my talking point about how excited we are about the quality of competition, and then I was reminded that members of this conference from 2007 to 2010 had four different teams win four consecutive national championships, LSU, Florida, Alabama, and Auburn. And if you look at the BCS CFP era and you add in Tennessee in 1998, we've had six different football programs earn national championships, which communicates the depth of our conference competitively. And I'll let you make the comparisons between us and our colleagues as it relates to national championship success in football. But as we watch the college football world change around us, we are absolutely proud of the competitive team and individual achievements earned through the Southeastern Conference, be that on the football field, the women's basketball court, baseball field, the world championships in track and field showcase young people who've had an experience in this conference and every other one of our 21 championship sports. The reality though is that away from the games and the playing fields and the courts and the tracks and the courses, it's been quite a summer, actually quite a year for those of us who write about, those of you who write about, and those of us who work in college athletics. You go back to June of 2021, we had a Supreme Court decision in Alston versus the NCA. The onset of name, image, and likeness really took place on July 1st through the onset of different state laws and an alteration of potential plans for NCA governance in the aftermath of the Alston decision. Later in July, we as a conference issued membership invitations to the University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas to join the Southeastern Conference effective July 1st, 2025. We saw creation of the NCA's Constitution Committee. We watched more membership transition among conferences in Division I. The NCA Transformation Committee was announced in December. We had another uptick in COVID. 
which introduced disruption and felt eerily similar to what we experienced through the 2021 year. We had, as you know, consideration of expansion to the college football playoff format that ultimately was not adopted under the current CFP governance structure. This spring, the NCAA announced the transition of its president, NCAA President Mark Emmert, and the commencement of a search to fill that role. And then on June 30, right after I got to my lake to relax, uh, the announcement came that the Big Ten would expand its membership to include USC and UCLA, which created a busy few weeks for you and for me as we tried to separate truth from fiction. You tried to figure out what your competitors knew or didn't know and what they were reporting. Tried to figure out the different agendas, and you worked to post stories quickly. So much for our summer vacation. So that brings us here to begin the talking season ahead of college football. And in preparation for my comments, I went back to my first Media Day's remarks in 2015. I'd been to any number of those as a member of the SEC staff, but I started reading through each year's comments. And in 2015, again here in 2018, and a couple times since, I began not with Mr. Spicoli's quote, but with a reference to Bob Dylan's, the times they are changing. And I've never lost sight of that reality. I'm not sure we all understand what is intended by those lyrics or conveyed by the phrases that the wheels still in spin, but times are changing more rapidly than ever. And you saw some of that play out this spring. So at our Destin meetings, we started with a small meeting of our head football coaches. And I went in with a very clear focus on a message, probably not the message that you thought I would communicate, maybe not the message they thought they'd hear, but one that was clear and direct. And as I walked into the room, I learned that someone had tweeted our head football coach seating chart. And the trending topic on Twitter became not the Destin Spring meetings, but look at this football coach's seating chart. But as we refocused, here's what I told our coaches. It is never going to be the same, but it doesn't have to be the way that it is. We're dealing with complex, complex problems that won't be solved by complaints, by accusations, by finger pointing, or by offering simple solutions. What is needed now is collaboration, deep thinking about real world solutions, and everyone participating in the conversation. The outcome, and I shared this in real time, was we had some of the most in-depth conversations with full participation through our spring meetings that I've ever experienced. And that includes not only our football coaches, but our women's basketball coaches, men's basketball coaches, our student athlete leadership council representatives, our athletics directors, faculty representatives, senior women administrators, and ultimately our presidents and chancellors that week. Each group recognize, recognizes that it's never going to be the way that it was, but it doesn't have to be the way that it is. And in that conversation, we recognize that all too often, what sounds like an easy solution to these complexities fails to consider the impacts that those easy answers have on, on many other matters. And frankly, in college athletics, we're here because we've either pushed aside some of those conversations and decisions, or we've dealt with the easy solutions rather than the complexities that account for the full breadth of outcomes and consequences. But in this environment, I'm proud to say, in my view, and I think in the view of our entire membership, the Southeastern Conference is stronger now than at any other time in our history. We're poised to grow to 16 members on July 1st, 2025. This expansion keeps the SEC in contiguous states, which supports a reasonable geography among like-minded universities and keeps us confident that fan interest will continue to grow in our communities, in our region, in this country, and literally across the globe. There's no sense of urgency in our league. 
No panic in reaction to others' decisions. We know who we are. We are confident in our collective strength, and we are uniquely positioned to continue to provide remarkable experiences educationally and athletically, along with world-class support to student-athletes. It is a compliment that people from all across the country and all across the globe want to be a part of the Southeastern Conference. We understand our fan base in our region. We have an outstanding relationship with our media partners, effective in the fall of 24, Disney, ABC, and ESPN, with a focus on how we continue to strengthen the SEC network. And I appreciate the talent, those of you behind cameras, those working in production that we never see in directing and coordinating to make what we do this week the best TV of the summertime. As you know, when we go through this change, we are considering how to schedule. And so some of those decisions were made in Destin, but our football scheduling model is still under consideration. We had deep and productive conversations in Destin. Those conversations actually began back at our meetings in August. And when we concluded our discussion in Destin, we had a focus placed on a single division model with the ability to accommodate either an eight-game or nine-game conference schedule. And I'll wink and say we could even accommodate a 10-game conference schedule. I see all of you look up. I just want to see if you're paying attention. So that's actually not our focus. We ended, though, with the understanding that more questions needed to be answered, including understanding the general timeline and the issues that need to be addressed as we think forward now about the college football playoff. We have to dig through a tie-breaking procedure. So we have over a quarter century in divisions, and we understand all the nuances about how to break ties. Well, we have to dig a bit deeper there with this single division concept in front of us. And we want to understand the impact through the use of analytics on bowl eligibility for our teams who are growing their programs and college football playoff access dependent on the number of teams that might be included. And so there are a range of possibilities being considered. We have time to make a decision. And if you, as you've seen before with us, particularly in the last few years as we dealt with some difficult issues, we're going to use that time to inform our decision making and not be subject to an arbitrary deadline. The national issues, though, go beyond the Southeastern Conference, beyond the college football playoff, beyond conference membership changes, and include important conversations about the future of the NCA and its ability to be effective at leading the overall collegiate athletics enterprise, and how we effectively support young people who choose on their own to engage in name, image, and likeness activity. Last July, on that list of issues we've seen over the last year, the NCA's Board of Governors issued a press release that included these words, quoting, the special constitutional convention is intended to propose dramatic changes to the NCA Constitution and to reimagine aspects of college sports so the association can more effectively meet the needs of current and future college athletes. And that same press release included statements like college sports must quickly adapt. This is not about tweaking the model we have. And we cannot go on as we are. At the end of that constitutional effort, what's really changed? You need to ask yourself that question. Did we need that effort to get at some of the Division I problems? I would submit not. But someone is correct in that statement that we cannot go on as we are. In October, the NCA announced formation of the Division I Transformation Committee. And I'm proud to serve on that committee with co-chair Julie Cromer and 19 other individuals who have spent an enormous amount of time trying to sort through the difficult issues we have. The press release announcing creation of the Transformation Committee referenced the complexity of issues in Division I. That observation was spot on. There is a complexity of issues that doesn't lend itself to the easy button. 
and not necessarily to immediate resolution. And so those issues include the need for a meaningful membership process, dealing with enforcement and infractions issues where college athletes face uncertainty and penalties related to actions that may have taken place when they were in junior high or elementary school. We have a rule book that simply grows and grows and grows. We have a governance process that has key committees and councils populated by participants who rarely, if ever, speak and who are being asked to make important national policy decisions when they may not have that same authority on their day-to-day -day work context on campus. We have a bureaucratic process that leaves issues languishing for months or for years. Again, it's correct. We can't go on as we are. We're making progress on those issues. In August, the Division I Board of Directors will receive a report which won't solve every problem, but will deal with issues around enhancing the student-athlete experience, modernizing, uh, modernizing the transfer rules, dealing with that rule book and trying to reduce it, and refining that infractions process with a focus on bringing matters to conclusion in a timely manner. And then as we, as we look at the fall, we're gonna have some difficult issues around membership. That issue was not created by the five conferences labeled the Autonomy Conferences or by FBS. It was assigned to the Transformation Committee by the Division I Board. We're gonna to have to determine how to make effective decisions in Division I. And there are incredible disparities around revenue, around expenses, around support, and around expectations in this division. It makes it difficult to ensure the presence of shared values and common purpose around supporting athletics programs. We also need to make sure we enhance the experience for student athletes in NCAA championships. What's happened before can never happen again. I don't expect that will be easy, but it's important and will play out through the fall months. I did not mention name, image, and likeness because that's been reserved by the Division I Board of Directors. And on May 9th, you saw a statement from the board that I think was helpful. The question is, what's happened as a result? We need clarity from the NCAA National Office on what's happening and what will happen under the NCAA Division I Board of Directors directive. It's a difficult issue subject to the onset of state laws that came into effect last July. And since that time, some of those same states have pulled back from those laws because it's in the state's competitive interest to do so. It's exactly what we warned about dating back to 2019, that a patchwork of state laws was the most ineffective way to approach name, image, and likeness. And here's our view. We need a clear, enforceable standard to support national championship caliber competition and national championships themselves, like the College World Series, the Final Four, and the College Football Playoff National Championship, and every other national championship. So there is a connection and a common basis for competition. Our student athletes, we just had a student athlete leadership council meeting. They asked us for clarity and for uniformity and for institutional support of their name, image, and likeness efforts. A national standard would mean that high school juniors and seniors and their families don't have to sort through dozens of different state laws or institutional policies where state laws don't exist. It's an unfair way to treat young people making a college decision and a common standard would allow them to have clarity around the rules and policies that govern their own decision-making and activity. Our football coaches were unanimous and unequivocal at our spring meetings when they discussed name, image, and likeness that booster activity should be completely removed from the recruiting aspect of their work. Our young people deserve consumer protection to ensure commitments they make do not create long-term entanglements and points of exploitation that reduce or eliminate their future earning potential. And lastly on this list for now, there's an absence 
of oversight for those described as agents. These aren't agents as we've come to know them over time. Or NIL businesses that approach young people and families directly with offers with no transparency. That gap needs to be addressed and the unregulated marketplace calls for action. The NCA is limited in its ability to govern this space. To put state universities in conflict with their own state laws is an impossibility. And litigation limits the extent to which the NCA can actually act. And that's why the continuing identification of Congress is the opportunity to set a national standard remains important. We did have conversations that if there's not a national standard, we need to explore if we can have common state laws among our 11 current states, eventually to be 12, to support healthy name, image, and likeness activities. Do we face headwinds in college sports? Absolutely. It's actually not new. It's a decades-old problem. And those decades-old problem now rest firmly on our agendas. The SEC will not be complacent, even with the knowledge that we're in a position of strength. Now's the opportunity and the time to continue to support our student athletes. And to the extent we can do more, we actually do more. We must take the step forward to make sure the experience that's present today is there tomorrow and for decades to come. One of the great things I'm able to do is visit with leaders of today, our presidents and chancellors, athletics directors, and other key campus leaders, and the leaders of tomorrow. Those are the young people on our teams, which is why, despite the difficulties, despite the challenges, knowing the successes that are present, I'm confident that the best days of the Southeastern Conference still remain ahead. So with that, Kevin, I'll turn it to you and we can uh, entertain some questions and we'll see how I do with the answers. Thank you, Commissioner. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Jack, Jake, and Preston, we will get a microphone. Uh, so we're gonna start right over here uh, in the middle. Uh, Ron, go ahead, Ron. Please give your name and affiliation. Yes, Ron Higgins, Tiger Details. Uh, Greg, do you anticipate Maybe Texas and Oklahoma coming in the league early ahead of time? That's not up to me. That's uh, about the relationship between uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and the Big 12. Uh, we are focused on the addition being effective July 1st, 2025. Okay, we're going to go down here on to our right, the second row. Uh, Richard Johnson, Sports Illustrated. Uh, Greg, with what's happened in the country the last few months, in addition to it being an election year, do you think that that makes it even more difficult for Congress to do something to make a clear, enforceable NIL policy? Go back, Richard, to March, and I made a list in a meeting of, of matters present, you know, a war in Ukraine, uh, the economy, uh, Build Back Better that was introduced and not moved, and, and the, the differences that exist in Congress and we have a midterm election coming up. And things that have happened over recent weeks and months have just added to that. Um, the reality was, when I had that conversation in March, I wasn't looking to necessarily this Congress to be the solution, just because of the timing. We've had conversations with, with leaders from both sides of the aisles, and we'll continue to do so, because regardless of what's happened recently or what happens with the election, we need a bipartisan solution. Uh, for this, this national concept to move forward. And if we don't, then we're going to be left uh, not simply creating conference rules. We're going to have to deal with state laws that vary in our region. And that was actually part of our conversation in Destin as well. But the focus will remain on a national solution. And Congress is the venue for that option. OK, we're going to go right over here on the left, about four rows back. Greg, uh, John Sokoloff at WCBI-TV in Columbus. You mentioned um, one of the bigger issues with that single division model was the, the tiebreakers and, and figuring out that stuff. What are some of the other issues when you all think about finalizing that single division format? John, you didn't even have to introduce yourself because I was in Omaha and heard you ask a question in those press conferences leading up to the Ole Miss National Championship. So uh, welcome to Atlanta. Um, uh, the, the list of issues, so tiebreakers won, uh, the number of games and what that means from a scheduling standpoint, the imbalance around nine games versus the, the comfort with eight games, um, what happens with non-conference schedules, and we have a requirement that that ninth game right now be among an autonomy five type opponent, what, how do we dispose of or, or maintain 
um, that particular policy. Um, the impact on, on bowl eligibility and, and college football playoff access I mentioned. When I go through six different teams having won national championships in the last 25 years or so, no one comes close to that number. So the level of competition here, while well, people want to be a part of it, uh, we're, we're attentive and sensitive to that. Uh, just to be clear, nobody from TV is saying do this or do that. This is a, this is a conversation and a decision to be made among our conference membership. Okay, we're going to stay in the same section, third row back, Kirk. Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. Uh, Greg, do you sense a lot of support for a model with three permanent rivals or anywhere close to a consensus on that? And is there any interest in expanding beyond 16 teams right now? Um, the, the first question is it's under consideration, Kirk. Um, and there are limits on uh, the number of options available for three permanent opponents based upon the number of gains. Games nine makes that more practical. If you remember, I had two points when we expanded that I wanted to be front and center. One is that we engage in blue sky thinking, just let's look at the big picture. Um, and the second is we rotate our teams through campus as frequently as possible so we don't go 12 years between visits. And, and so those, those two um, have guided us. That last one relates to the number of games, number of permanent opponents, and how many times you can move people through cleanly. And that's exactly the point of conversation. Um, embedded in my remarks is we're attentive, we're engaged in conversation. Um, the great news for the Southeastern Conference is that people call and say, hey, you're doing something really special, and they kind of hint around the edges. Um, as, I, as I went through, we know who we are. Um, we're, we're confident in our success. We're really looking forward to the, the expansion and being at 16 teams and don't feel pressure to just operate at a number. Uh, but we'll, we'll watch what happens around us and, and be thoughtful but be nimble. Commissioner, we'll go to our right, second row. Charles Odom with the Associated Press here in Atlanta. Following up on what you, what you just said, um, do you, you said you don't have a sense of urgency or panic in, in reaction to what others are doing, but in, in looking at what others are doing, do you, does it affect your um, receptiveness to those calls that you say you're receiving from others? Do you see this heading toward a conglomeration of, of super leagues, and do you have to be proactive to be at the front of that? Well, somebody will write that a smart aleck guy. We are a super league. I mean, that, when I walk through the recitation, this is a super league. So as I visited um, with our presidents and chancellors and ADs, and I understand the timing is this news broke June 30. I did not gather that group until the next Wednesday. Uh, I wanted to make sure I learned what was actually happening. But also I didn't want a story like on Friday, the day after, oh, the SEC presidents are gathering and then you have this ripple effect of they're going to do something. Um, and so we wanted to be patient and wanted to communicate. Um, I, I, again, we're comfortable at 16. There's no sense of urgency, no sense of panic. We're not just shooting uh, for a number of affiliations that make us better. Could they be out there? I would never say they're not. I would never say that we will. Um, we're going to be um, evaluating the landscape. I'm not going to speculate. And I actually am watching a lot of this activity operating around us more so than impacting us directly. Okay, we're going to go right back down here in front, third row. Bob. Hey, hey Greg, how you doing? Uh, Bob with Arkansas Democrat is that this is kind of a multi-part question. Um, what, what, I was curious, what, what lake was it where you were on vacation, and um, did you get to take any vacation? Did you have any inkling what the Big Ten was doing, and do you think Texas, no, you Trump, you, you, USC and UCLA when it comes to adding teams to a conference? Uh, I'll start. Uh, at the end, yes. I'm not sure we want to use the word trumped all the time these days, but you know, be careful about that. Um, yeah, I, it, we're in contiguous states. It's a southeast quadrant. I do have a few letters about what's the southeast mean, but we are in the southeast quadrant of the United States. Uh, those two additions actually restore rivalries. You know, the Texas-Arkansas game last year was pretty special, but that goes back a long way. Obviously, Texas and Texas A&M rivalry um, will be like our in-state rivalries across the league. 
You have Missouri and Oklahoma that are a quarter of the Big Eight that are now part of the Southeastern Conference and the opportunity for Arkansas and Oklahoma to play regularly. I think that's right. That, that's who we are. Those fan bases get it. One of the very first calls I had, it's like, hey, we watch how you've made decisions in the Southeastern Conference and how you want to achieve uh, as universities and athletically, and we want to be a part of that. Absolutely, that's right. Um, did I have an inkling? Uh, I'll be honest with you that about 18 months ago, I said, here's some projections of what could happen, and those two schools were part of it nationally, but I didn't know that this was about to happen on June 30. No, not at all. It, as I look and try to project what takes place and guess, um, that type of movement was somewhere in my, my thinking, but not at that moment. Um, and it's where I grew up, in Skinny Atlas, New York. S-K-A-N-E-A-T-E-L-E-S. -E so I've lived in two places that are tough to spell, Skinny Atlas, New York, and Natchitoches, Louisiana. You're going to have to get Natchitoches on your own. We'll stay in the same section, a row back. Hey there, Greg. This is Lane Higgins from the Wall Street Journal. Where are we at, Lane? There right here. Um, I wanted to ask you about how your thoughts on access to a college football playoff might be evolving. Because I know, you know, before this latest wave of realignment with USC and UCLA moving, you had been very adamant on an 18 model with five automatic bids. And no, no, no. I, I, I'm going to come back to that. But okay. <laughs> I, I meant against that. Against not, that. Not supportive of that. Okay, yeah, right. I'm sorry. You had strong opinions about it. Herb's going to get on me for interrupting you, so I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but I'm curious how your views of what a potential model when the playoff would expand might look like, given that we are in this current state of flux where maybe the conferences are changing and you know maybe automatic bids might not be given equal weight given where conferences are heading. Yeah, my, just to be clear, and I apologize for my rudeness there, but that one... Uh, somebody's live tweeting, and I'll be, co I'll be credited with that thought. Um, I, I walked into one of the first meetings when we were looking at the format and said, uh, if we want to expand to eight teams for the playoff with no automatic bids, uh, I'll have that conversation. But moving to an 18 playoff and granting what we're going to be six automatic bids and reducing at-large access is, is unwise. Um, and in fact, if you look, I think 2014, you would have replaced the eighth best team in the country with the 20th best team in the country. I don't think we could survive that from a credibility standpoint. But the pressure was there to have conference access with some guarantee. And so the 12 team, six at large, which increases the at large access, and six uh, conference qualifiers, not automatic qualifiers, but the guarantee to the six best conference champions, was, was a really good balancing outcome. But things have changed. And I was clear. Uh, back in January, and we walked away from the conversation that we as a conference weren't unanimous in our support. Um, I had, as commissioner, moved people forward to the point we were supportive as a league. And if we're going to go back to square one, then we're going to take a step back from the model introduced and rethink the approach. Uh, number of teams, whether there should be any guarantee for conference champions at all, just earn your way in. Um, there's something that's healthy competitively about that and creates expectations and support around programs. Where we go, we'll see. We've had one initial conversation um, in late June. I walked into that meeting not very optimistic about the ability to talk through issues, and I walked out much more positive about the path forward um, than when I walked in. And there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we have time and we'll use it. And it's the same type of issues that you've heard, AQ or no AQ, how many teams, what's the relationship to the bowls, when do we play these games on a calendar. We, we really need to look at that more deeply than we did in the, in the previous iteration. So we'll, we'll see how it, how it goes. But that, those are the realities. But um, I, I'd be fine with no AQs, whether it's four, like we have now, it's a model that's worked, eight, 12, but the inclusion of uh, champion, uh, conference champion access was I, was, I thought, an effective compromise at a 12-team playoff. We have time for a few more. We're going to start right here on the front row on the right. Uh, I'm just curious about uh, the NIL. I know we were talking about Super Conference. Can you talk about how that has helped uh, us acquire the, the, the title of Super Conference and uh, how you see that progress in the SEC? I think we, we, the Southeastern Conference, were a super conference before name, image, and likeness. In fact, I've made that clever, I've provided that clever answer uh, a few times over the last seven or eight years. 
Um, there are any number of good stories. You know, I was up the road here an hour in Athens, Georgia, when, when Auburn gymnastics competed and SUNY Lee was cheered by everyone in Stegman Coliseum. You don't get that much between uh, rivals when, when they're cheering for an individual student athlete. Um, I'll stay. Karis Jackson talked about a Bojangles deal when he was in in Destin with our leadership group talking about, I think it was 45 steps to making a Bojangles biscuit that he engaged in on social media. Um, Olivia Dunn at LSU is one of the good stories, very prepared, very ready for that. Those are the activities that we thought would be present and, and should be present, allow young people to build the brands. And I think there are uh, many more stories beyond just what you read in recruiting uh, that are positive, but one of the concerns up front was that we not do this state by state. We need uniformity. That feeds in to our ability to have national competition during the regular season and support national championships. And so the notion of some oversight, transparency, uh, regulation of the market, I think, is exactly what helps everyone. Um, and, and I'm convinced, regulated or unregulated, we can do well, but I think the unregulated market creates a set of problems for the people involved, whether it's young people and their families trying to make decisions, the potential for long-term life entanglements and deals that aren't understood and evaluated, uh, the lack of support, the taxation that comes. Uh, but we've also allowed it to enter into the recruiting space in a really weird way, and I think that needs to be made healthier than it is right now. Okay, we'll go back over here to the right in the middle. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, Michael Giddens, The War Report. Uh, given some of the public comments from coaches about the effect of NIL on recruiting and the classes, is there a feeling from the conference office that member institutions are abiding by the spirit of NIL rules? And how's the conference office supporting educating athletic departments on best practices when it comes to NIL? The issue is, are they abiding by their state laws? So whether it's spirit or not spirit, the issue that goes back when we're in consultation is are you following the laws of your state or uh, in the past one, one circumstance an executive order in our footprint. Um, it is uncomfortable. It is a new dynamic and we're going to have to manage through that discomfort. Um, I don't believe everything I read. Um, you're great writers. You're great at what you do. But I don't believe everything I read has um, the depth of information or the depth of analysis because what I've not read is the points of concern where young people have lost opportunities or promises and commitments haven't been fulfilled. I look forward to reading those types of analyses. But the focus from the conference office is on providing uh, guidance back to the states that have to provide the information. And we, we provide educational um, information. It's tough when that changes routinely through states. And in our footprint, there are 11 different state laws. And then you have a, uh, questions coming in about the, the laws or lack of laws in effect in every other state as well. Okay, we'll take one final question over to our left. Second row. Hey, Greg, Ben Portnoy from the state newspaper. In Destin, you had mentioned that there was at least a hope to get the scheduling model resolved by the end of the year. Is that still kind of a realistic timeline? And you'd also mentioned that Texas and Oklahoma had been involved in those discussions when it comes to realignment as well. I guess how much are they able to be involved in those discussions as well from conference level? Uh, last of all, we, we invited both the athletics directors um, and the presidents and chancellors into our, our conference call uh, a week and a half ago, just so because this is a long term issue that, that has impacts beyond just the here and now, so that they could hear my analysis and, and ask any questions of us and, and hear questions asked by our other campus leaders. Uh, when we moved into August last year, we had an athletics directors meeting that happens each August. Uh, we actually invited both to attend so that we could set this by video, so Zoom, since we're really good at Zooming now, so they could hear the introduction of how we we're going to consider information around scheduling. And when we've had um, important updates or important conversations, they've been a part of that. We did not invite um, either university to Destin this year just becomes its own story and distraction. And you may recall we had enough storylines heading into Destin uh, already. So we, we provided actually updates to them through the week. And um, they've been great uh, emerging partners in this process, talking about their interests and priorities, just as our other 14 do. Commissioner, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for being here. And uh, look forward to the interaction that we'll have in the coming days, and I'll see you back here in just a moment for my first head coach introduction. Thank you.